So that's the, mo the, the motivation is this cover from The Economist from 2010, which is the title of this presentation. <coughs> Coming to a city near you is the question, and then a picture from uh, one of the uh, uh, riots in, in the center of Athens. Uh, the assumption being that Greece is prefiguring perhaps uh, what is going to happen uh, in the rest of Europe or in the rest of the world. And, and of course the, New York, the Time, Time magazine came with uh, a picture of the protester as the person of the year, uh, providing a sort of am am amalgam of various protests starting from the Arab Spring, including uh, a portrait of two Greek uh, protesters, Occupy Wall Street protests and a variety of others, and suggesting that there is perhaps a global phenomenon taking place, uh, and this is a composite picture of various protesters, but the fact that it looks very Muslim or Middle Eastern suggests the power or the weight of the Arab Spring on that understanding. <coughs> and so uh, that's the main motivation. I want to um, answer two, or try to answer two related questions. The first one is whether uh, the uh, economic crisis uh, in Europe uh, whether it is likely to produce major events of public unrest. Of course, we do not know, we can only speculate, we don't have, uh, even in political science, the ability to predict or forecast these kinds of things, but we can produce educated guesses. And so the sub-question to that is, what do we know, really? What does the uh, research so far uh, tell us about the connection between public unrest and economic crisis? And the second question is uh, whether Greece uh, is a prelude, uh, whether what was going on it has been going on in Greece for the last uh, three years is a prelude to s the future of Europe, whether the Greek present is the European future. What can we tell about that? And I'm going to give you the previews of my answers. First uh, is that we don't really know. It's too early to tell whether there's going to be uh, uh, a wave of public unrest in Europe. And the evidence about the connection between the two is very mixed. And so it's very difficult to really say something uh, solid. Uh, and the second, um, the second question I'm, argue, I'm going to argue that no, that the Greek case is exceptional, that it's not prefiguring uh, a larger wave of protest in the rest of Europe. And I'm going to try to explain to you why I think so, uh, and I'd be happy to discuss my uh, assumptions and, and hypotheses. So we have, first of all, to clarify the set of phenomena trying, we are trying to understand. Um, we usually use a variety of terms that tend to cover <coughs> all those. Usually uh, sociologists who study these kinds of things use the term contentious action uh, as an umbrella term covering a variety of uh, political action that takes place outside the realm of established political uh, practice and institutions. But that covers a very broad range of things. Uh, on the one hand, and at the low end, we may think of pro peaceful protest, regulated protest, uh, including strikes, which is very well established. And some people would say routinized and institutionalized in ways that are part and parcel of how democracies operate. Uh, but then there is a next step. Sometimes protests are, tend to be disruptive. Uh, they tend to produce uh, to say block the center of cities, you have uh, protesters who may decide to occupy uh, roads to block traffic, and, and so that would be uh, in the scheme of things an escalation of that first stage. And then, of course, we have the, the, the next stage, which is violent protests or riots, and the violence varies. It can be violence against objects, it can be violence against persons. And finally, at the very extreme of this content, continuum of contentious action within an established polity, assuming right the state has not collapsed, we are not observing a civil war, we have terrorist activity, we have, uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, a set uh, of violent practices that take place under uh, clandestinity rather than in, in the open among uh, the crowds. But certainly the three first steps, I'm, I'm not going to discuss terrorism, the first three steps are steps in which there is uh, a crowd. Uh, the crowd is the main actor uh, of uh, politics. Um, what do we know about the connection uh, between public unrest and economic crisis? Well, there is a, not, a lot of anecdotes. If you read The Economist, if you read the press, the media, uh, people point out that a lot of very disparate events, the riots in London, uh, riots in Rome, at Greece, at the Indignados movement in, in Spain, Occupy Wall Street, they connect the dots. Uh, they very often suggest that those things are connected, they're part of a wider picture. Uh, they are part of uh, a new emerging phenomenon. Um, 
Very often also people refer to anecdotes of the past, and here the favorite metaphor, the favorite analogy that people use would be the analogy of the Weimar Republic, um, meaning, you know, a, a situation of very intense, polarized uh, politics with a lot of uh, public protests, which eventually led to the collapse of, of, of the German democracy. Uh, and there is also an amalgam of a variety of different processes. For example, the Arab Spring uh, is a quintessential process of uh, the use of protest in order to challenge an authoritarian regime. And, and that is then compared or amalgamated with protests in the context of established democracies in which uh, the, the, uh, the objective may be not to change the regime or challenge the regime, but to uh, get the political uh, parties, the political elites, to address a set of concerns. Uh, the one thing that, that is really um, problematic in that kind of approach is that there is a lot of cherry picking and selection bias. People select the kind of cases that fit best with their argument if they want to argue that this is really a wave of protest. They emphasize the cases that make uh, the most noise and attract the most attention. There isn't much attention about the dogs that do not bark, uh, to use uh, Conan Doyle's uh, metaphor about uh, the situation is in which, in spite of tremendous economic hardship, we do not observe uh, public unrest. Or we do not think of the opposite. If we want to think about European, <coughs> the European scene uh, in the second half of the 20th century, the first half of the 21st century, probably the event that really dominates uh, in terms of uh, the magnitude of public protest was May 68 in France. And this is a time uh, of uh, the expansion of the economy, uh, of the development uh, of economic expectations, uh, of the you know, belief that uh, there is really no limit to development. It's not a time of contraction, it's not a time of crisis, it's exactly the opposite. So how come if there is a connection between crisis on the one hand and unrest on the other hand, how come we observe this very big uh, uh, event that still dominates memories uh, at a time of expansion? So we need to, uh, to focus on much more systematic evidence as opposed to anecdotes. The problem is uh, we don't really have much research. There is research that has only started recently, and the evidence that comes out of this research, as I'm going to summarize it, is quite mixed. One argument that is quite interesting and that I uh, use mostly uh, evidence from Latin America is the argument that there is a connection between public unrest but not economic crisis, you know, really political institutions. The argument is that where political institutions are not responsive or are not perceived as responsive, <coughs> then uh, the street really becomes the alternative political arena in which people uh, express their uh, demands and, and the argument here is a comparison between various Latin American countries. The two cases that really stand apart are Argentina and Brazil. In Argentina there is a tradition and a practice of public unrest. In Brazil there isn't and even though in economic terms very often those countries are really comparable. The argument in that paper is that you really have different institutions. Institutions in Brazil are much more respon responsive to people's demands but not in Argentina. And of course there is a second degree question about why it is that <coughs> Well, if this is true, then probably the argument would be that given the metrics that are used to characterize institutions as opposed to our opinions, uh, it's very difficult to think that uh, uh, European institutions are going to be challenged. They tend to be, uh, in terms of every kind of measure you can think of, among uh, the most democratic uh, in the world, in spite of their shortcomings and problems. And therefore, the argument here would be that uh, if institutions are really the channel through which people protest, then uh, we are less likely to see uh, protests happening in Europe. Uh, and of course, then the question is also how to explain uh, variation among countries with, with similar institutions. France, for example, is a country that for a very long time has produced a lot of public unrest in terms of demonstrations, <coughs> strikes, blocking. Uh, roads in terms of a typical kind of repertoire of contention that emphasizes very much public action and street action and crowd action. Why not Germany, for example? <coughs> Recently there was a, 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 an interesting paper that got published by two German economists and uh, they got a lot of attention. This is from the Guardian uh, website. This is the title. Far fact, there is a link between cuts and riots. We've studied a century's worth of social unrest, and the data suggests austerity measures 
it can lead to riots. This is the most forceful and the most systematic statement so far about the connection between uh, not just economic crisis, and I'm going to talk about that more specifically, but about uh, uh, cuts uh, in uh, the economy uh, or, or austerity measures, to be more precise, uh, on the one hand uh, and riots on the other hand. Um, the paper is available, you can read it. it. It's an econometric paper, so it can be challenging. It's not written for the large public, but it's worth paying some attention to. Uh, so just to restate the argument from the paper, uh, from the end of the Weimar Republic in Germany in the 1930s to anti-government demonstrations in Greece in 2010-11, austerity has tended to go hand in hand with politically motivated violence and social instability. That's uh, the take home of that paper. Uh, and of course, Greece figures very prominently. That's the statement, the opening statement, and part of the abstract. And so the authors claim that they provide a clear positive correlation between fiscal retrenchment on the one hand and instability on the other hand. For those of you who uh, deal with econometrics, of course, you know that the holy grail is causation rather than correlation. Nevertheless, given the dearth of research, that's a very powerful argument. Uh, there are a number of problems, however, with this paper. Uh, to start off, uh, they pick a very specific dimension of uh, economic activity or economic crisis, expenditure cuts. And the reason is they don't really find a connection between unemployment, you would think unemployment would be connected to public unrest, a, a collapse in growth, for example, or other measures of economic crisis do not correlate with public unrest. It seems that specifically public expenditure cuts are associated uh, with unrest, but it's not clear why. Uh, and one wonders when you do not find uh, the effect being uniform across different types of the same phenomenon or different measures of the same phenomenon, you wonder whether if the effect may be an artifact of the data and the data analysis method as opposed to uh, a real correlation. The second problem with this paper is that it uses a metric for the measure of public unrest and instability that comes from an American scholar, Arthur Banks, that is very problematic, compiled from newspapers with a tremendous amount of reliability problems and a tremendous amount of inconsistencies from countries to countries. And so we need better data. The problem is uh, better data has not, have not been compiled thus far. We really depend on that. But this is a very problematic data set. And therefore, one has to be very careful about drawing inferences from it. Third point is that the finding actually does not hold across all dimensions of public unrest. It holds from dem for demonstrations and riots, but not assassinations or general strikes. Why is it? the different forms of public unrest are responsive uh, to public expenditure cuts, and, but not other measures. And again, that raises questions about, uh, in the absence of a better theory of how these things are connected, raises questions about uh, perhaps data artifacts. Um, then there is another uh, problem, which is recently there's been a, a work uh, that, that uses very sophisticated econometric methods and, and quite good data. Uh, in a variety of very different contexts, insurgencies, showing specifically that unemployment does not correlate with participation in insurgencies. Uh, again, that raises questions about what may be the mechanisms connecting the two things. And finally, and I think that uh, almost finally, probably the most problematic part of the paper is that in fact the result is conditional on time. They find a very, very strong correlation for interwar Europe, but as the 20th century progresses, the connection between, on the one hand, public unrest, and on the other hand, economic cuts, goes down and becomes disappears for the period after the 1970s and 80s and, and the 90s. So there is no effect for the post-1990 period, and, and this is really a problem because this is the period of globalization, and this is the period uh, that follows the end of the Cold War. Uh, so there is something perhaps that is systemic that may explain why that connection no longer holds. Uh, and there is something perhaps that is connected with the interwar period and interwar politics that makes the connection very, very conditional on the timing uh, and the historical period. Uh, <coughs> there is one factor which I'm going to argue is critical, and this has to do with left-wing politics. And um, I strongly suspect, and they do not control for that factor in that paper, that it is the decline of left-wing politics that may be associated with the collapse of the connection between 
uh, those two factors. Uh, and in fact, I, I would hypothesize, I'm starting to do some research, suggesting that the connection between those two factors is conditional on the presence of strong <coughs> left-wing uh, politics. Okay, so that's the extent of what we know about the general connection between those two factors. Let's examine the Greek case, which people have pointed out, really uh, prefigures, perhaps, uh, the future of uh, European politics. And, and again here, the, the way in which uh, public unrest and riots has been represented uh, in the media is, as, is that, um, as the cover of Liberation goes, the Revolte de los Tres is really, it's a, it's a kind of revolt, uh, a protest of those who suffer from the austerity measures. And I'm going to argue that that's not necessarily a good description uh, of the phenomenon. Um, and, uh, but that has attracted a lot of attention. As you can see from the picture, it's always, it makes a great uh, cover uh, for uh, media. And of course, uh, it, it is very nice kind of um, argument uh, for a lot of Greek intellectuals abroad because it makes Greece not just a specific case, but a case of global significance. And, and of course, it's always nice to argue that your country really is the avant-garde of, of politics globally. Uh, and this is a, a talk which actually took place a couple of days ago in which precisely that point has been made. And generally speaking, um, I tend to be very skeptical about you know, arguments that emphasize exceptionalism or idiosyncrasy as an argument. I'm a scholar of comparative politics. I always want to make general kind of statements in which comparison allows us to understand what are the general effects. But in this particular instance, perhaps that's my own bias, I do believe or I do think that the evidence suggests uh, that there is specificity. Uh, I don't need to emphasize very much the background, which I do when I, I speak uh, to non-Greek audiences. Uh, I would say that, generally speaking, uh, there's been a series of very spectacular riots, especially uh, since the beginning of uh, uh, Greece's uh, participation in, in the so-called uh, memorandum uh, set of different uh, programs of restructuring. Uh, and there have been four, four peaks of, the, of that activity, the most recent of which was very recently producing a lot of uh, destruction in the center of the city, uh, producing some uh, human fatalities as well. Uh, and you know those four moments are all associated with major uh, votes in the parliament about Greece's participation to specific aspects of, of that program restructuring. Uh, there is also a very interesting and not very much noticed uptick in terrorist activity, especially at the uh, uh, post-2008 period that has kind of uh, decreased, but I think it's quite important and, and, and tells us something, and I'm going to return very briefly to that point. There are a number of puzzles, however, when one thinks about the Greek case, uh, and I think those puzzles force, <coughs> force us to, to reconsider the idea of a sort of unproblematic link between uh, the very real economic uh, strain uh, and suffering that uh, the Greek population is experiencing on the one hand, and uh, rioting activity on the other hand. The first one is that even though Greece uh, is not the only country participating in these very, very uh, tough restructuring programs, it's really the only country in which we observe this high uh, level of rioting. Portugal and Ireland have participated in programs of equal magnitude and equal uh, pressure, but have not really exhibited uh, you know, anything resembling the same level of activity. It's not just a matter of magnitude, it's a matter of complete qualitative difference. So why is it that countries, in a sense, that are put through the same program do not really produce the same effects? It may have to do then with something that is specific to the country rather than with something that is specific to the program, because those programs are very similar, the economic difficulties and the economic suffering and the social uh, pressure experienced by those countries are not very different. Uh, if you look at the country that really implemented perhaps the most strenuous and difficult deflation program, which is similar to what Greece is trying to do to deflate, to internally devalue instead of uh, devalue by, by devaluing its currency, which it cannot do, that is Latvia, which uh, implemented a, a very, very difficult program that caused a tremendous amount of uh, 
suffering um, and, and led to a very, very, very deep recession. And yet we haven't heard of Latvia because it didn't produce the kinds of pictures that Greece has produced in every day the uh, of the news. Why is it that even a worse, most diff much more difficult kind of program with much bigger effects, why is it that it uh, that didn't produce the same effects? We have seen protests, uh, usually not riots, but we have also seen a few cases of riots so far in Europe. Um, Protests primarily in Spain and US, but they've been <coughs> primarily uh, very peaceful protests. And then a few riots primarily in the UK uh, and, and Rome, uh, on the other hand. Um, the thing about the UK which makes it very interesting and very different from the good case is that the riots were not really uh, connected for the most, especially during the past summer with protests. They were almost an independent event. And, and that, all, you know, all those puzzles force us to think about whether there is a Greek exception. Uh, and then the, the question is, if there is one, what may that exception be? Uh, so the point that I want to make, and, and the puzzle that really pushes me in that direction, is that Greece has had uh, a history of disruptive public protest and riot activity that goes beyond the, pre, you know, the, the recent measures uh, of the memorandum, the recent problems of the economy. Uh, and the recent crisis, and perhaps gives us some clues and some hints about what may be going on, what constitutes the specificity. So let me give you a very brief overview of that story, of, of uh, is, uh, which characterizes Greek politics uh, uh, in the post-1974 uh, period. Um, the first thing that one can point out, and there are a number of quantitative indicators supporting this claim, is that in terms of strike activity, public protest, Greece has had uh, quite a lot, much more than uh, the average in Europe. Uh, and, and this is a list uh, of a number of uh, points in time in which there's been uh, activity that has uh, crossed the threshold from disruptive, simple disruptive protests to, to major riots, very often associated with the loss of human life uh, and frequently uh, with uh, a lot of public damage. And these are the, the, I'm, I'm just going to show you a few pictures associated with those events that resemble a lot what has been going on since the crisis, but that the international public never gets to see. The international public is fed this image that everything is new. Uh, what is going on in Greece is, is really a, a novel phenomenon. Uh, in fact, even the arsons that took place in Athens in uh, last month are not new. There have been major arsons in Athens in the 1980s with the destruction of uh, the major department stores, of course, as a result of terrorist bombing as opposed to public protest, but nevertheless undertaken by, by people with a revolutionary agenda. Um, there's been major uh, public unrest in 1985, uh, which was associated with uh, the shooting of a youngster uh, by the police. Uh, very well known picture from that period. Uh, there's been a tremendous activity of both terrorist action and public protest in the period between 1990 and 1991, which was a period of major political instability uh, in, in Greece, um, also causing uh, the loss of human life. Um, and again, the, the pictures bear a lot of similarity with what has been going on recently, but also in a variety of smaller kinds of events that we have forgotten uh, riot activity has taken place in the center of Athens, and of course the main uh, flare-up has been December 2008, <coughs> uh, which as far as uh, the destruction of public property in the center of the city surpasses still what has happened since the beginning of the crisis, and December 2008 uh, was before the crisis and before the introduction of measures, still a time of expansion or at least uh, stability in the Greek economy. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, the rioters, but uh, sometimes body language speaks volumes. Uh, and, and usually I, I used to show these pictures, you know, we are all familiar with that, uh, and the most recent one. Uh, so, the question then, uh, which is going to lead me to, towards my conclusion is, okay, let's assume we have really an exception here, let's assume we have a long history of uh, public unrest and, and writing, why? What may explain this Greek specificity, if that is indeed the case? Um, to, uh, as an introduction to that uh, question, one has to keep in mind 
the question of units of analysis, because very often there is a confusion about what is being explained. There are usually, uh, one needs to distinguish between the macro level, what explains, for example, the fact that Greece produces high levels of that kind of activity, and the micro level, the micro level being what are the uh, incentives and what are uh, the choices that individuals who participate in those events make. And of course, a good theory would be a theory that is able to explain both macro level variation and micro level variation. And I'm going to provide you a set of two arguments about the macro level. Um, the first would be that there is an element that uh, can be associated with a political culture uh, of Greece after 1974, which explains...